But uh, so far, so good, and I'm very happy to introduce our first speaker, Sebastian Sivers, who will speak about communication and spark graph classes. Please, Sebastian. Thank you very much. Yes, and thank you for the invitation to this very nice workshop. My, I will speak about kernelization in sparse graph classes and because it's the first talk it maybe makes sense to quickly introduce the topic of kernelization even though I assume you all know what it is. So kernelization is a technique especially in the field of parameterized complexity for designing efficient algorithms by a pre-processing phase. So you have this big instance I which is parameterized by a parameter k and you aim to preprocess the instance in polynomial time to get a, a smaller instance on which you can then uh, perform a brute force algorithm if you like. So this makes sense in the parameterized setup because you cannot expect to... Uh, better like this? Yes. You cannot expect to get smaller and smaller instances for NP complete problems, otherwise you would get a polynomial time algorithm finally. So formally a kernelization algorithm for a parameterized problem Q is an algorithm that given an instance IK works in polynomial time and gets you an equivalent instance, meaning that if it's positive then you have a positive instance again, if it's negative you have a negative instance and you want that this instance is small, so the instance plus the parameter is bounded by a function of the parameter alone of g of k for some computable function. So it's a very classical result that a decidable parameterized problem is kernelizable if and only if it's fixed parameter tractable. Right? So very short proof for this. Um, assume that we have a kernelizable and decidable problem. Uh, we want to get a fixed parameter tractable algorithm for this. So on instance uh, ik we compute this equivalent instance from the kernelization algorithms i prime k prime which is small and now because the problem is decidable we have a decision algorithm running in time f of instance size for some computable function f and we just apply this algorithm to this reduced instance and we get a total running time f of g of k the composition of computable functions is again computable um, and then some polynomial time for the pre-processing, so this is a fixed parameter algorithm. And vice versa, if we have an FPT algorithm, we have Q fixed parameter tractable, so we have an algorithm running in time f of k times polynomial in the instance size. And now the kernelization algorithm for this instance runs exactly this FPT algorithms for i to the c plus 1 steps, if c is the degree of the polynomial, and now what does the kernelization algorithm do? If this algorithm A terminates, then we return a fixed instance which is equivalent. If it does not terminate, then we simply return the original instance IK. And why is this a kernelization? Because if the algorithm did not terminate in this time, by the choice of our running time here, we conclude that the instance is smaller than F of K. Right, so we have computed actually a kernel of size f of k. What we get here is most likely quite a large kernel and lot, lots of research is about finding small kernelizations. We, we like to have this function here actually polynomial or linear in the best case. However, this cannot be uh, always achieved. Okay, so I will speak about kernelization in sparse graph classes. So it's a lot about graph problems. Um, for example, the vertex cover problem is fixed parameter tractable in general graphs. We are not going to speak about this too much. Um, the independent set problem, for example, parameterized by solution size is W1 hard. So we expect that in general graphs there is no kernel for this problem. Or the dominating set problem parameterized by solution size is W2 hard. Again, we expect that there is no kernel in general and the question that I want to ask is what are the largest classes of graphs where we can actually uh, have fixed parameter algorithms where we have kernelization algorithms and in particular how can sparseness help to get efficient algorithms. <clears throat> so what do I mean by sparseness? 
usually when we speak about sparse graphs, we just mean number of edges divided by number of vertices should be small. This is not a very robust measure in the algorithmic context. Yeah, because every graph can be made sparse by just adding some isolated vertices. So if you just add number of vertices, square many vertices, then you will have small edge density. Yes, and the, uh, the structural and algorithmic properties of your graphs will not change a lot for many problems, like for the vertex cover problem or dominating set problem. If you add a star, this will again be, yeah, this will give you a sparse graph and the, the algorithmic properties don't change so much. Um, so what we like to have to, to make such padding tricks not possible is we should have graph classes where we can just take out vertices and we get again a graph from this class. Yeah, so the, the classes should be closed under removing vertices from, from the graphs and get again a graph from this class right, to avoid such padding tricks. And now if we want to design a sparsity-based algorithm, then it makes a lot of sense to say if an algorithm works for a graph G and we take out an edge, then the graph gets sparser, so the algorithm should also work on this graph G minus this edge. Right? So our graph classes should also be closed under removing edges and this means exactly that the sparse graph classes that we consider are classes that are closed under taking subgraphs. Yeah, so this will be the sparsity notion that I'm working on. This is actually quite strange because for example the class of all graphs under this definition is also a sparse graph class. Yes, if you have an arbitrary graph you remove something again you get an arbitrary graph. Um, we will get dichotomy results by taking this definition. Yes, we will have things like on every sparse graph, meaning or sparse graph class, on subgraph closed classes, either the problem is W too hard or it admits a linear kernel. Something like this are the types of results that we will get. So sparse graph classes, you know, uh, you are quite familiar with it if you work in graph theory, I expect. I assume you have seen planar graphs. They are sparse, they are closed under taking subgraphs, even under taking minors. There is this more general notion of excluding a minor. They are sparse graph classes. We have the very prominent notion of bounded tree width. Um, then some maybe less known classes of bounded expansion and nowhere denseness. And this goes uh, here, another line, bounded degree, excludes topological minors, degenerate classes, the very classical notion of sparseness, biclic free graphs, and then something that you maybe have not seen that I will be talking about in the next uh, minutes. Then some non-sparse graph classes which also have received considerable, considerable interest are bounded clique graphs and some other notions that I will speak again about. Okay, so let's first look at the independent set problem. This is actually quite boring on sparse graph classes. Yeah, so if we have a subgraph closed class that contains all cliques, then in fact we have all graphs in our class, right? Whatever clique, we take a sufficiently large clique and remove edges and we end up with the graph that we like to have. So it contains all graphs. And now, on the other hand, if we do not have all cliques, yeah, so there is a bound such that we do not find some complete graph on uh, T vertices, the complete graph KT, then we will actually always have a large independent set. Yeah, this is just the, by the classical Ramsey theorem, if we have a graph with M plus T minus 2 choose T minus 1 vertices, then we will either find a clique with T vertices or an independent set with M vertices. So if we don't have KT as a subgraph, then we will always be in the second case here, if we just start with a sufficiently large graph, we will have a large independent set. So this is actually quite boring, yes, and we get the following result. Independent set parameterized by solution size on subgraph closed classes is either W1 hard, if we have all cliques, or if we don't have all cliques, then we have a trivial polynomial kernel, right? We just take the graph, we take a sufficiently large subset to find an equivalent instance and this will give us a polynomial kernel for the problem. Dominating set is a bit more interesting. Let us 
look at the problem. So dominating set is the question, you have a graph, you want to find a set of vertices so that every vertex not in the dominating set is adjacent to one vertex from the dominating set. You can quickly verify that this is the case here. This is a dominating set for the graph. And again, we have such a dichotomy. So if we have all bi-cliques, then we have in fact all bipartite graphs. Yeah? So starting with all bi-cliques, we can again delete edges and end up at any bipartite graph that we like. And now dominating set on bipartite graphs is just as hard as on general graphs. There is a very simple reduction. If we have a graph G, we make two copies of this graph and we don't connect the, the vertices by the edges in the original graph, but we connect them by their copies and by themselves. Yeah, so every vertex dominates exactly what it dominated originally, just in the other copy. And then we add some pendant vertex, which is connected to all vertices of the first copy here, and we add k plus one vertices, which are just adjacent to this one vertex. And now if we ask for a dominating set of size k in our original graph, we ask about a dominating set of size k plus one in this graph. Yes, k plus one vertices, if you put all your dominators up here, then you will not dominate the whole graph, right? So this is not an option to put all of them here, meaning to dominate all of these, you must put one dominating vertex on this guy. And this means that all of these vertices here are dominated. Yeah, so now it's all about dominating the remaining graph here. And we can see that we can just, whenever we want to dominate something, we can as well, if the dominator is down here, we can put it up here, right? So a dominating set in this graph, we can assume uses this vertex and uses vertices from here. And this translates exactly to a dominating set in the original graph. Yes, so dominating set on bipartite graphs is W2 hard. And yeah, if we have a subgraph closed class and we have all bi cliques, then we will have again W2 hardness. And the question is now, can we do it nicely if we exclude some bi clique? Yeah, some KTT, some complete uh, bipartite graph with T vertices on each side. And in fact, we can do the one way to do it is uh, with the use of domination cores. This is the approach to do it today. There were many uh, results who, who designed uh, explicit FPT algorithms first. Now the way to go is via domination cores. So a K domination core in a graph is a set of vertices so that every set of size K, our, our parameter says, size, um, which dominates this core, dominates already the whole graph. Yeah, so look at this graph for a second. K is equal to two. We have a dominating set of size two. These two vertices here dominate everything. Now, which set would you pick and say, if you dominate this set already, then you dominate the whole graph? Yes. Obviously, the whole graph always is a domination core. Yes, this is a trivial answer. We are looking for small cores. So what would be a minimum size set in this graph such that if you dominate it with two vertices, then you already dominate the whole graph? This is a question. Maybe someone sees it. Sorry? Um, those two vertices. Actually not. Maybe one vertex from that layer and one vertex. Mm -hmm. Let me quickly say why not. So if you say these two are in the core, I have these two vertices, for example, which dominate the two, but they don't dominate the whole graph. Right? I ask that every set which of size at most k, yeah, every set D which dominates must dominate the whole graph. So dominating those two dominators is not enough. Yeah. One vertex from like first layer, not second layer, yeah. this and one? one from the above. And one from this? Yeah. Also not enough because I can just pick this one and that one and dominate it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Six 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 six. 
size three, first edge, third and fifth. Maybe that or any six vertices. Exactly, I heard it here. We can also take this one. Yes. I can only dominate this set by those two vertices. Whatever other vertices I take, like this and that, they dominate this part here, but this guy is not dominated. Okay. So this is a domination core. Yes? If I pick the bottom left from your rectangle and the top right. right. This one and this one. Yes. You are right. I should even make it a bit bigger because those two dominate actually. Yes. Very good observation. You should have been quiet. <laughs> but, okay. Yes. But you get the idea, yes? Um, it's a small set that we are looking for. We want to dominate this. And somehow the, the point is that we can dominate it only from outside. Uh, yeah, and, and it captures the domination properties of the whole graph. And we want this to be small. Of course, domination cores cannot exist in all graphs. Otherwise, we yeah, are from a domination core. It's not so difficult to get to a kernel and then to an FPT you algorithm. Need more than two vertices, right? Sorry? You need more than two vertices, right? Two four. Because you can just pick that vertice as itself as a domination for that yeah. Yes. You always need more than two vertices for the core. Otherwise, you just pick the two. Exactly. So that option is not there, right? Which option? Yeah, so these two don't do it exactly because you can just use that as the dominator for this set. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So how do we get to a kernel from the domination core? Yes, we have the core here and now we define an equivalence relation for the vertices which are not in the core actually and we define the vertices u and v to be equivalent if they see or dominate exactly the same part of the core. Yeah? So if the neighborhood of u intersected with the core is, is equal to the neighborhood of v, v to the core and all we have to do now is keep one vertex from each projection class. Right? Because it's only about dominating the core. If you dominate the core, then you dominate everything. So we say H is a graph induced by the core and by one vertex from each projection class. And now actually, we are not producing an instance of the, of the dominating set problem anymore, but of an annotated version of this, because we are asking now in H only to dominate the core. So we have the observation that G has a dominating set of size K if and only if the core can be dominated in H by K vertices. You can make it an instance of the dominating set problem again uh, with this trick that we have seen before, adding the pendant vertex with K plus one other vertices. And we will be forced to pebble this guy. Um, then it may not be an instance of your original graph class again, so this is somehow technical. Yes, it's and picky. Yeah, but you get the idea here really from the core, you get to a kernel, and we aim to find small k domination cores. So here is the result for bi click free graphs, so that we get exactly this dichotomy that I was speaking about. If we have a graph class, which excludes some bi clique, so excluding KDD as a subgraph. Yeah? Then, if we have a dominating set of size K, then we will always find a domination core of polynomial size, which can be computed efficiently. Yeah? And if not, we can tell that there is no such dominating set. Right? And now, how does it lead to, to a polynomial kernel finally? Uh, potentially, if we have this set C, which is the domination core, we could still produce an exponential kernel yeah, because there could be exponentially many projection classes. Every subset of the core could potentially be a projection class. However, this doesn't arise in KDD free graphs due to the sauer scheler lemma, which is actually a bit more general. If we have a graph of bounded VC dimension, so VC dimension D, if we exclude KDD, then for every set that we look at in the graph, this equivalence relation of equal projections has at most a to the d plus one many classes. Yeah, so this uh, 
this little blow up that we have to do to build the kernel, this actually gives us a polynomial blow, blow up only and we are fine with this. So if we exclude KDD, then we have a bound on the VC dimension. We can use the sauer schiller lemma and conclude for uh, the dominating set. So we have this dichotomy result, dominating set parameterized by solution size on subgraph closed classes is either W2 hard if we have all the bicliques or it admits a polynomial kernel otherwise. Okay, I want to show you how actually to find those domination cores in more general graph classes, not in subgraph closed classes now, which is a super simple algorithm and goes even beyond the KDD free graphs. So very simple algorithm, we want to find a K domination core. I start with arbitrary K vertices that do not dominate the whole graph. Yeah, I can choose the same vertex again and again. So this may be just a K tuple of the same vertex. Uh, maybe could you close the door? Thank you. Yes. If every single vertex dominates the graph, then our kernelization problem is trivial. Yes, so let's assume that we cannot dominate the whole graph with just one vertex. Let's pick just yeah, k times the same vertex and assume that it doesn't dominate G. So we pick some vertex B1 that is not dominated by this set. And we iterate this procedure. We find k vertices that do dominate B1, but not the whole graph. Okay. We can actually do this efficiently. Yes, we just again compute the projections to the sets we are looking at. So at this point, we have the vertex B1. We take, we iterate through all the vertices of the graph and we see how do the projections to this set look like and see is there a set of K vertices dominating B1 and not dominating the whole graph. Yeah, we iterate, we pick a vertex that is not dominated, we go on and on, we find a vertex in round I that dominates those I vertices that we have picked in each round, but that does not dominate the whole graph. Right? So observation, if at any point we cannot find such a set yeah? What does that spell? Every set which dominates B1 to Bi dominates the whole graph. This is exactly the definition of a K domination core. Right? So very simple algorithm to find a domination core if it exists. Well, does it make any sense? Maybe this runs forever. Right? This is the problem of this algorithm. The trick is to now look at the graph classes where this actually terminates. So let me show you in picture the algorithm again. We have our k vertices not dominating all vertices from the graph. So this dashed line means there is a non-edge. We look for another vertex set dominating what we have found so far, far not dominating the whole graph and we continue in this fashion. Yeah? So the structure we find here is what we call a semi-ladder, right? A semi-ladder consists of two sequences, A1 to An and B1 to Bn. Now the Ans to Yans here, these are tuples of vertices, not vertices in the graph. The Bns are actually vertices from the graph. Yeah, and they form a semi-ladder if their relation looks exactly like this. Yeah, so Ai Bj is an edge whenever I is greater than J. So every I here is connected all the way to the smaller vertices and those AI, BIs are not edges in the graph. So here AI is a set? Here AI is a set, exactly, of at most K vertices. We could call this the domination graph, right, where we have like the K tuples on the one side uh, and the, the vertices really on the other side. And at this point we ask about the semi-ladder index in this domination graph, which is actually of size n to the k plus 1. We don't want to construct this. Yeah, it's, it's too large to construct it. However, we want to conclude from the original graph that we have bounded semi-ladder index in this domination graph. And this we can actually do. So we say that a class of graphs has bounded semi-ladder index if there exists a number n so that we don't find 
half-induced semi-letters of order n. Half-induced means here that I care only about the edges between the two parts of this bipartition. There can be any edges that you like between vertices of the same partition. Yeah. And now it's a quite simple application of Ramsey theorem to see that for every k and every graph, the k domination graph, yeah, where I have exactly the k tuples of vertices on the one side and I connect them with the vertices of my graph if one of them dominates this vertex, yeah, that this k domination graph has bounded semi-ladder index if and only if the original graph has bounded semi-ladder index. Yeah, so I can conclude from the fact that my original graph has bounded semi-ladder index that the domination graph has bounded semi-ladder index. There is a Ramsey blow up in this, yes, at least exponential. Um, so from semi-ladder index L, you will have like L to the K at least for the semi-ladder index in your domination graph. Yeah. So we observed this, that this very simple algorithm actually uh, leads to domination cores. Yes, so every class with bounded semi-ladder index admits a domination core of size f of k for some function f, yeah, which is this Ramsey function. This is exactly the algorithm for finding the k domination cores that I just showed you. And now the interesting question is which classes of graphs actually have bounded semi-ladder index. And if you look at this picture, you see that a semi-ladder will give you always, if it's long enough, a large complete bipartite graph. Yeah, if you look at the, the upper part and the lower part of the semi-ladder, like this, this part here is a complete graph. Yeah? So in particular, for biclic free graphs, you will get the domination course by this algorithm. However, you go to much more general classes, which are in particular no longer subgraph closed but a very simple approach to find those domination cores. So one other observation here, bounded semi-ladder index is just the same thing as bounded ladder index and bounded co-matching index. So a ladder is this graph here. This looks quite like a semi-ladder already. I want to exclude such a ladder here. In the semi-ladder index, I'm not allowed to have those edges that go between the, the copies of the vertices, in a sense, and the semi-ladder index also allows that I have edges in this other direction. Yeah? And then with the Ramsey argument, you can combine those two forbidden structures here to conclude that bounded semi-ladder index means exactly bounding the ladder index and bounding the co-matching index. So a co-matching, um, you have the matching and you just complement it. Right? So here I've drawn the edges in, in dashed, which are not there and in white lines all the edges that are there. Yeah, so it's a complete graph except for the matching edges. Now, the bounded co-matching index alone is enough to show that cores cannot exist in all graphs. Yes? So let's look at this complement of a matching. It has a dominating set of size 2 and you cannot dominate it by one vertex. Right? Whatever vertex you pick, you will not dominate the guy on the other side which is not connected by an edge, right? But every proper subset can be dominated by one vertex. Yes, so you will not have a domination core which is non-trivial, right? You, for the domination core, you need, if you dominate with, with one vertex this core, then you must dominate the whole graph by definition and this cannot exist in the co-matching, right? So this actually constitutes the limit for the existence of domination cores and for, for this approach of computing first the domination core and then doing the classification of how vertices around the core interact with the vertex set. Yes, so one question here that is interesting is whether bounded co-matching index is sufficient uh, for the existence of domination cores. Yes, we argued now about bounded semi-ladder index and the question is whether this bounded ladder index is actually a condition that we need. Yeah, or, or can we do it uh, with bounded co-matching index alone? Mm -hmm. I'm 
so uh, I must be missing something. Mm -hmm. So you say every subset of VG can be dominated by one vertex, mm -hmm. but if you delete two vertices which form a missing matching, you still get a uh, component of a matching. Yes, but you can dominate it from outside, right? Pick any subset which you assume is your domination core. Oh, so you you will always dominate it by any other vertex, okay, so which is core, so yeah. exactly. Okay. Mm -hmm. So no cores, no non-trivial cores exist yeah. in those complements of matching yeah. yeah. graphs. Mm -hmm. Are there natural examples of classes that have bounded co-matching index but not bounded ladder index? Um, yes, so I'm coming to this now, yeah. Um, actually, the co-matching is a super simple graph class. Yes, we can handle this in another way. My next slide is again, so we have the bounded semi-ladder index here. We go beyond the biclic free graphs, right? And in particular, this class is no longer closed undertaking subgraphs, yeah, but undertaking in induced subgraphs. However, this co-matching graphs they actually have bounded click widths and they are super simple to handle. So we can compute dominating sets, yeah, just not by this core technique. And the question is really, what do we need now? Uh, where do those ladder indices actually come in? And yeah, exactly. Um, so staying on this slide, yes, we have the polynomial kernels here in the, in the sparse graphs, in the subgraph closed classes. If we have kernels, then we have polynomial kernels. Then we can go with this bounded semi-ladder index to more general graph classes. There we just have this bound f of k where we don't know exactly how it looks like, but at least exponential. Yeah, so we have larger cores here. Then we can actually handle the situation very well in graphs of bounded clique widths. We cannot compute cores, but we can extend the methods for bounded tree widths to bounded clique widths graphs and compute dominating sets in bounded clique widths graphs. And the big questions now are, we do not have cores in these classes here, like VC minimal, monadically stable, dependent classes. These are some examples um, where we can have the co-matching index unbounded. Um, and we don't know actually how to, how to handle the situation. Yeah, so the question is, can we get FPT algorithms without using this technique based on cores? And then bounded VC dimension, which has popped up, we know that we cannot do because, for example, on uh, unit disk graphs, the problem is already W1 hard, and this has a bounded VC dimension. Yes. So this is really about the core technique. Okay, so let's turn to another question. Um, I want to look at the distance r dominating set problem now. Yes, so I'm, I'm allowing a vertex not to dominate only its neighbors, but for some larger radius r, I allow the vertex to dominate the vertices. For example, here I have a distance 3 dominating set. You can quickly verify that every vertex not in this set is at distance at most 3 to one of those red vertices. Yeah, so this is a variant of the dominating set problem. And actually, it's the same problem. Yeah? So distance r domination is just domination in the graph where I build the rth power of the graph. Right? However, what I lose when I go to the rth power is sparseness. Yeah? Exactly what I'm assuming, my techniques that I'm building on, the sparseness techniques, they get lost. I'm losing information about the graph if I build the rth power and try to solve the distance r dominating set now. Yeah, or the dominating set in the power graph. Nevertheless, uh, with this observation, we get FPT algorithms for some graph classes. For example, if I have a graph of bounded tree width, then the graph to the power r, g to the r, has bounded click width. Yes, and on bounded click width graphs, I know how to solve distance r domination or then domination if I need to solve it. Yes, or if I have a planar graph, then I know that g to the r for a fixed r has locally bounded click width. Yes, a special case being the case of map graphs. And again, I get an FPT algorithm for a distance r dominating set by the observation, if I look for a dominating set of size k or a distance r dominating set of size k, then the graph cannot have too large diameter. Yeah, every vertex can dominate 
like r on the left, r on the right. So in total, if the graph has diameter larger than 3kr, then I can give a negative answer. Otherwise, I know that my, yeah, that the, the rth power has bounded cliquids, and I can solve the problem in this part. However, we are losing uh, the information, and from this clique width alone, I cannot conclude that there exists cores, right? Because we observed the, the complement of a matching does not admit cores. Bounded clique width graphs, yeah, it, it has bounded clique widths. So from this alone here, I cannot conclude that I have a core for distance r domination. And what we proved is that actually powers of nowhere dense graphs, including the planar graphs, including excluded minor graphs and many more. Um, these powers for fixed values of R have bounded semi-ladder index. So actually you have somehow this, this core technique available if you want to work with a distance R dominating set problem. Yeah? Um, we are not using this here to, to really build the, the cores, but we do the analysis on the original graph. This was done before just as an observation that uh, that we have this property and that we get stronger properties than just when taking the, the power we have bounded local click widths, for example. Yeah, so there is more structural information available when building the powers of nowhere dense graph classes. Okay, so back to sparse graph classes. Yeah, this, this notion of nowhere denseness pops up again. We have exactly this dichotomy that we had for the dominating set. Um, also for distance r dominating set, and this time it's not the biclic free graphs where we have the good behavior, but we need to make stronger assumptions. And in particular, those nowhere dense classes play exactly the role of the biclic free graphs. Yeah, so we proved in 2017 with many co-authors that for every nowhere dense class and every radius r, the distance r dominating set problem is fixed parameter tractable on C and in fact we have an almost linear kernel for, for the problem for every radius of r. And vice versa, if we have a subgraph closed class that is not nowhere dense, then the problem is W2 hard for some distance. Yeah, so we have for the more general problem here, again such a dichotomy and the kernels are not only polynomial but even almost linear. And we have now, if we look at the distance r independent set problem, this suddenly gets more interesting again on sparse graph classes because we do not have the property anymore that we exclude in the power some large clique. Yes, so just the independent set problem is boring in sparse graph classes, but the distance r uh, independent set problem, we can have large cliques, so it's now non-trivial that we can solve it. And again, the nowhere dense classes play exactly this role. Um, we proved that for every nowhere dense class and every R, the distance R independent set problem again has an almost linear kernel um, and vice versa. If we have a subgraph closed class that is not nowhere dense, then the problem is immediately W1 hard. Yes, so very nice dichotomy results and nowhere dense classes play somehow a special role here. So let me quickly introduce or give you a very rough introduction to nowhere dense classes and the techniques that are used in those classes. So nowhere dense classes generalize uh, the notions of excluded minors. I assume that you are familiar with, with excluded minors. We find a graph H as a minor of a graph G if we can contract connected subgraphs of G to single vertices, right? So we have here marked in the, in the figure uh, connected subgraphs and we just identify them with, with single vertices and we connect the two blobs that we get here by an edge. Yeah, if there is an edge between any vertex of, of one of those connected subgraphs, right? And then we obtain H as a minor by this operation of contracting uh, single vertices, deleting vertices and deleting edges, right? Now we go to a more general concept. We add an additional constraint on the contractions that we are allowed to make. We add a radius constraint 
you see that somehow this is relevant for the distance r domination. So um, we say that a, a graph is a depth r minor if we are allowed to contract only subgraphs of radius at most r. Yes, in the figure here we have a depth 1 minor. You see that for each of those blobs here you have a spanning tree of radius 1 yeah, and you are allowed to make those contractions. Yeah, so this is a bounded depth minor. And now a class is nowhere dense as a generalization of excluding some minor globally. Um, if for every radius you will not get all cliques at this radius as depth R minors. Yeah? So at level zero, this means you do not find all cliques. At level one, you are allowed to make such contractions, contract just stars in your graph, you will not get all cliques. You will always have a bound depending on the radius of the contraction that you make. Yeah, at radius two, you get something larger and larger and larger, but it will always be bounded by a function of the radius, the cliques that you're allowed to find. Yeah, these are nowhere dense graph classes. So here are the excluded minor classes, and then nowhere dense sits above this, is more general than that. In particular, uh, we do not find all biclics, so nowhere dense classes are biclic free, but they are no longer degenerate. They can have more than a linear number of edges. Okay, so what are the tools to, to attack the dominating set properties of nowhere dense graph classes? Um, how much time do I have? Ten minutes. I will, I will very quickly uh, discuss one concept for, for nowhere dense graph classes and we will revisit this, this ladder index, those ladder arguments to, to make efficient algorithms or combinatorics. So um, nowhere dense graph classes can be characterized by a notion called uniform quasi-whiteness as a preparation, a simpler concept which is called uniform whiteness. Yeah? So we call a set B distance R independent if all its vertices have pairwise distance greater than R. Yeah? And now we call a class uniformly white if whenever you start with a large set in your class you will find a large R independent set. Yeah? So let's put some numbers here. It's uniformly white if there is a function this is the target size of your R independent set yeah, and you're working with the parameter R. So a function n of m and R so that for every independent set size m that you wish to have, if you have a set A which has at least this size, this should be reversed, um, then I will find an R independent set in the graph. Yes. I claim that you know uniformly white classes. Yeah, what are these classes? This is just a very strange name for a graph class that is very familiar to you, I expect. Can you repeat the question? Sorry? Can you repeat the question? This is a definition in disguise for something that you know very well. Yes, so what is uniform quasi-whiteness if you speak about graphs only? Yeah, it was introduced in model theory, there is more background to this, but if you just apply this to graphs, a uniformly white class... And the maximum degree. Exactly. These are graphs which have a fixed degree bound. Yes? If you have bounded degree, then it's very simple to find such R independent sets. Yeah? You just take the degree to the rth power, if you pick one vertex, you cannot pick any vertex in this R neighborhood of bounded size, yeah, and you greedily go on. So m times degree to the R will be the function for bounded degree graphs, proving that they are uniformly wide. And vice versa, if they are uniformly wide, then you plug in the parameter R equal to 2, yes, and now assume you have a vertex of large degree, all the vertices have distance 2 connected by this central vertex. So you cannot find in the neighborhood of this vertex a large 2 independent set. Yeah, it doesn't exist. Only one vertex is independent from the others. So this function n of 2 and 2 bounds the maximum degree of your class. Yeah, okay, so strange definition 
for maximum degree bounded graph classes. However, we can generalize this concept. Uh, we have many tools for graphs that are bounded degree graphs, yes, and we want to lift those tools now by the following modification. Yeah, so here's our observation. Class is uniformly wide if and only if it's a bounded degree class. Now, this star example somehow captures everything that's happening and how we want to generalize the concept. We call a class of graphs uniformly quasi-wide if we can kill the bad behavior of the stars, in a sense. Yeah? So we want to find our independent sets. Maybe we are not able to do it simply because we have vertices of high degree. Yeah? So let us just delete those vertices which are screwing up the properties of, of giving us this nice wideness property. Yeah? So in the star graph, we know if we build the second power, an independent set, a two independent set will be just an independent set here. We don't find large independent sets here. Let's delete this central vertex. Now we can find independent sets, yeah? very large ones. So taking this to, to a formal definition and making it more general, a class of graph is uniformly wide. Again, if we start with a large set, then we are now allowed to delete just a bounded number of vertices, and after that we want to find large R independent sets. Yes. So with the numbers, yeah, now we have this function n again, and we have an additional function s, which uh, bounds the number of vertices depending only on R that we are allowed to delete. Yeah. So if we have a subset A, which is just sufficiently large, then we will find a set of vertices to delete, in the picture just the central vertex, and then we find a set which is R independent. Yeah? So you see for domination this makes quite a lot of sense, yes? In our nowhere dense graph classes, um, they are somehow far spread after deletion of a bounded number of vertices. And this is exactly what we want to look at when we care for distance R domination. Yeah? How is the graph connected? How can we make it fall apart? How can we recurse with deletion of a few elements? Yeah? This is the, the tool to go for nowhere dense classes and the distance R domination. Um, so uniform quasi-wideness is equivalent to nowhere denseness. This was proved by Nashville and Osona de Mendes. I will show you one tool now uh, how to prove this uniform quasi-wideness. Yeah? So it's not a problem to find large independent sets. By definition of nowhere denseness, at level zero, we have some clique excluded, yeah? some KT excluded. So we have seen this inequality before. If we start with such a large set, then we will find a large independent set. But now a two independent set is a completely different matter. And we can apply the erdos shekeres theorem here. If we have a one independent set, which is large, yeah, but exponentially large, and this is the problem here, yeah, then we will find either a two independent set of size m, this would be a very nice object, or a subset of vertices, so that all vertices have pairwise distance exactly two. Yes, and we are looking for this year for those two independent sets. So let's assume we don't have them and we are in this situation, yes? We want to find vertices at pairwise large distance, but we want to get rid of those exponential bounds here. Yeah? So let me build the distance two tree of a set A, which I assume is independent. Let me make an animation for this picture so that you really get what I'm doing. I have the set A and the vertices come one by one. I put the first vertex simply as the root of a tree. Now comes the next vertex. If it's connected at distance two, then I put it to the right of this vertex. Yeah? So the meaning is there is a vertex which connects the two. Right? Then comes the next vertex. Say it's not connected to this one, then I will put it to this side here. Yeah? So this vertex does not exist. There comes the next vertex. I see, is it connected to this one? Yes, it is. Then I go to the right. I test, is it connected to this one? Yes, it is. Then I go also to the right of this one. 
Yeah? This can be a new vertex, this can be this vertex again doing the connection and so on. Yeah? So this is how I built this distance two tree. And now, well, how can this help? Um, obviously, this set of vertices where every guy has distance two to everyone else is just a sequence or a long right path, yeah? an all right path because at every step I'm making this decision, do I have distance two to all of the neighbors on this path? Yes. And I'm asking now, when do I find long right paths only? Yes. So I define the alternation rank of such a tree or first of a root leaf path exactly as what you would expect. Yeah. How many alternations in the tree do I have on such a path? The alternation rank of a tree uh, as you would expect, the number of alternations on, on any paths here. And now the key observation, how we get away from those exponential bounds. Yeah? If I have a binary tree whose alternation rank is bounded, then to achieve height h, then I don't need an exponential number of vertices to fill in, but a polynomial number is sufficient. Yeah? So if I have a binary tree of alternation rank t and I have height at most h, then I have only polynomially, polynomially many vertices. Yeah? <coughs> Usually you would need two to the height many vertices to fill this tree up. So let's prove that the distance two tree in nowhere dense graph classes has bounded alternation rank and hence that we can make our arguments with polynomial bounds, yeah? which is the key to many things. So, this vertex here is on the right of that vertex, meaning exactly they have distance two, there is such a vertex connecting the two. This vertex as well, yeah, it went to the right, so there is a vertex connecting the two. However, this one is not equal to that, right, because this vertex is on the left of this guy. So this one is not at distance two to this one, so this one must be an individual vertex different from this guy. Yeah, and this argument we can make again for this vertex here. We can make exactly the same argument for the upper part of the tree, finding those vertices here, yeah, making all of those connections. And now this is the depth two minor of a complete graph. Yeah, the complete graph, each of these guys here is connected with each other one. Yeah? And by definition of nowhere denseness, we have a bound kt, which we cannot find as a depth two minor. So we have a bound on the alternation rank of, of those letters that you find. Okay, so this may seem very special now to nowhere dense classes, but think about the use that you may get from it. Yeah? Whenever you do Ramsey arguments, think whether you can whether you can build this tree, yes? You, in the Ramsey arguments, you want somehow monochromatic parts or parts which behave exactly alike, whatever uh, part in your, in your sequences or subgraphs you look at. If you can classify in this way and prove that the resulting structure has this bounded uh, alternation rank, then you will be able to do the, the Ramsey arguments with polynomial bounds, which can be super useful. Okay, so I think my time is almost up. So, um, yeah, we, we proved that we can make those uniform quasi-wideness bounds with polynomial bounds. I, this may not be the most interesting to you, but hopefully this technique can prove valuable. So let me go to the end of the talk and let me show you this picture here again in conclusion for the kernelization of, of distance R domination or just domination. So we have seen a very nice dichotomy for the dominating set problem on subgraph closed classes. Yeah, we have polynomial kernels and this core technique working all the way to biclic free graphs. Actually this dichotomy, if we have um, yeah, some biclic free graph and the class is subgraph closed, these are exactly the classes where we have uh, kernels for the dominating set problem. Then we have extended to classes which are not subgraph closed by this very simple uh, ladder algorithm or semi-ladder algorithm as we call it. 
And then we have the questions we can do with FPT algorithms for bounded clique width graphs, but how far can we actually push? We know that we cannot make use of this core technique anymore. We must use different techniques, but really the questions are, what are the exact limits of tractability based on sparseness, based on other structural measures um, where we can get FPT algorithms for dominating set or for distance R dominating set in the more general case. So thank you very much. Um, I believe it's hard to compute it exactly. Yeah, so the, the nice thing is that you don't need to compute really the bound, but you will just run the algorithm and you know if your class has bounded semi-ladder index, then your algorithm will terminate and output a core. Yes, but computing it exactly, I guess, is hard. Yeah, just as computing VC dimension, um, I guess it will be hard. Yes. We, we didn't look at it, but I think it's W1 hard, simply. Is it in XP? I mean, it's in XP? Um, I don't know. We can... Mm -hmm. question? So uh, I think I, I missed what the upshot is of this bound um, for uniform quasi-wideness for the independent set problem. Does it easily follow that you get an FPT algorithm for distance R independent set? Um, you will all, it's quite technical, yeah? Mm -hmm. So this somehow is the intuition that your graph falls apart after deleting those vertices, yeah? This is the, the intuition, but then it gets technical to to really get the cores and, uh, well, for domination, the cores and then for independent set, uh, the kernel, which is something different, yes. Uh, so it's, yeah, I didn't explain it exactly. It's just the intuition that really, if you ask about distance R, independence or domination, independence is also a local problem, even though it sounds like the opposite, yes. Uh, give me vertices that are far apart. Well, you go greedy. Um, if you find an independent set, then you're happy. If not, then every vertex must be within small distance of what you have picked greedily. Yeah? So again, you have something local, and this you decompose using this uniform quasi-whiteness and argue <coughs> somehow about the core connection points uh, to take apart your graph. Horrible. <laughs> it's really horrible. Yes, I think so. Though, um, uh, so you want the edge densities to be small, and then there are those two round type uh, questions. What edge density forces a large complete? Uh, subdivision now, or, or minor, yes. So for just finding uh, a subgraph, it's quite clear what you have to do, but then with the subdivisions, you, you really have horrible functions and you iterate for our time certain processes and, and it's bad, yeah. It's a, it's a tower of height R at least, and then one over epsilon, so I would say. Some, yeah. Yeah, something like this, exactly. So it's, it's quite horrible. Yeah, so it's far from being applicable in, in practice, I would say, even though we are testing with this and doing implementations. But yeah, it doesn't really rely on the theory, but it's rather heuristics uh, that work well in practice then. Any more questions? Okay, thank you once again. Thank you. So we have a half an hour of coffee break. <laughs>